All right, praise the Lord. We know that we're rapidly coming to the end of the age, and there's a lot of speculation and looking towards the virus issue and the vaccination issue. And we've talked about, and you've heard other people talk about linking the the, the um, Corona vaccine to a possible pretense by which you can't go and buy and sell unless you can prove you've been vaccinated. This is a, a possibility. It's a plausible scenario that could come to pass. And uh, needless to say, we're, we're coming close and rapidly to the end of things. And uh, it's always in such a time as you think not. And this is uh, the flower of sin. Second Timothy 3, this know also that in the last days, Perilous times shall come. Now we know sin is abounding. Grace does much more abound. We know because iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. And uh, iniquity is abounding. This is a generation of cultivated iniquity, cultivated um, pursuit of self and seeking of self, where self becomes the idol. But anyway... Paul talks about the last days, perilous times. First thing, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. And again, we, I've always attributed the, the I've, I've attributed this condition primarily in the Western culture, anyway, to the advocating of individual rights, like the United States. I have a right. I have a right. You know, if I have a right. I have a right, children's rights, gay rights, all the rights. If I have a right, then I have the power. That's what I'm saying. You know, the, if I have a right, then you, then I, I can do what I want, in other words. Civil rights and liberties means I am free to pursue my own life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But that's not the call of the gospel. The call of the gospel is not... Life, li liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in this life. That's not the call of the gospel. And that justifies the pursuit of loving yourself. That's what civil rights and uh, liberties have done. It has loosed the pursuit of iniquity and loosed the pursuit of loving yourself, pleasing yourself, finding happiness in life, in this life. That's the pride of life. That's not of the Father. That's the spirit of the world. You know, Western uh, civilization and United States, American civil rights and liberties is flawed at the core when you compare it to Christianity and what we're ca called to. What are we called to? Pick up your cross daily. Deny yourself. Don't cultivate yourself. Don't look for pleasure and happiness in this life. What did Jesus say? He said, in the world you're going to have pleasure, happiness. No, in the world you're going to have tribulation. tribulation. We've got to find our consolation another way. Christians got to find their consolation, and we say it all the time. Where are you going to find your consolation? In the sufferings of Christ. Paul goes on in 2 Timothy 3. I'll read it, but I'll allude to it, and I'll probably read it again. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer, what? Persecution. Rejection, persecution, affliction. You know, that's the uh, sort of badge of the Christian, isn't it? Well, there it is. So, uh, And I'm going to talk about rejection because uh, my sister Anita was mentioning it to me uh, in an email. And it just uh, prompted me to revisit the issues of rejection and bitterness and all of that stuff. And that's kind of the platform from which I've been preaching for a long time. The gall of bitterness is the bond of iniquity. And the pain of, the, of bitterness is the feeling of rejection. And yet, and everyone's trying to flee that pain of rejection. You know, when the Bible says in Psalm 119, I think it is, that the pains of hell got hold upon me. The feeling of alienation and rejection got hold upon me. It's, it's from those... Feelings of the wounds of rejection, the gall of bitterness, that all iniquity springs forth from that condition of heart. When the heart is in the gall of bitterness, the feeling of personal rejection, then it feels isolated, alienated, separated, apart, alone, tormented, afflicted. And its sense of isolation, looking to connect to something, looking to be appeased of its feeling of pain, from that 
It is motivated every pursuit of false comfort there is. It comes from that condition of heart. So if you can win the battle on the level of rejection, if you can win the battle on that level, you've won the whole battle. But Jesus said, the devil's come, he has nothing in me, because I am not rejected, even if every man on the earth rejects me. I'm chosen of God, I'm accepted by my Father in heaven. And that makes me complete. Amen. It makes me whole. It makes me thoroughly um, qualified and equipped to bear everything else. Because I always know I am accepted of God. And the Bible says, you are accepted in the beloved. And as much as we talk about the fear of God and the severity of God, if you don't know you're accepted by God, if you don't know God is your Father, if you don't know, for the Father Himself loves you because you believe that I was sent from God, if you don't have that root in self, you're not going to endure. It's prerequisite. It's imperative. It's necessary. It's You have to have that kind of establishment in your heart. That's why the devil had nothing in Jesus. So go ahead, reject me. You know, I don't care if you're a saint. I don't care if you're an angel from heaven. I don't care if you're the apostle Paul himself. I don't care who you are. If I've got my root and self in God, I'm not being defiant. I'm not being defiant. I'm not being uh, rebellious. I'm not rejecting God. I'm not rejecting hierarchy or authority in the church. I just have a root in myself. The ultimate heart of perfection has been established with God. And that's something we have to pursue, having root. When we were talking about perfection, and these have no root in themselves. These are they which have no root. They don't go on to perfection. If you go on to perfection, it means you have to have root. You have to know who you are. You have to know you're a son of God. Well... And a lot of this centers around, fundamentally centers around the issues of bitterness and rejection. And of course, it's going to be old storehouse stuff for us. We've heard heard it, but we're going to revisit some of the stuff and see where it goes. But anyway, let me get back to 2 Timothy and then I'll go back to the rejection thing. So what's the number one condition of men in in the last days, the perilous times, men are lovers of their own selves, and never has the love of self been cultivated more than through American philosophy of having rights and liberties and pursuit of happiness and all that. That's, there's nothing, that's not Christian. We talked a lot about liberty. Jesus Christ, you know, stand fast in the liberty. People think that the liberty that God gives is the liberty to do what you want. Like we said, that just flies in the face of the first, first most fundamental call of the gospel, which is not, not to... Uh, Serve yourself or seek yourself, but to deny yourself. So, uh, and that's that's our generation, the most the most selfish, self-seeking. Okay. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. Incontinent, incontinent means uh, no control. You can't hold back. You you have no control of your spirit. Every impulsive emotion demonstrates itself. You have no self-control, put it that way. You have no rule over your spirit. You know, if you're if you're if you're uh, if you're in a giddy mood, you laugh and you you're giddy. If you're angry, you lash out and angry. You don't you don't gird yourself. You don't. You don't uh, control your spirit. Anything that comes in just has a direct path to be expressed through you. In, in, in medical, when they say that you're incontinent, it means you can't hold back your pee. That's what it means. But when you're spiritually incontinent, you just can't hold back any emotion that rises up in you. When the Bible does tell us to have discretion, you know, and that sort of thing. Okay. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high miners, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. I'm going to, again, I'm going to make this distinction about denying the power. What does it mean, denying the power of God? Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Is this, 
denying of the power of God, denying that God has grace, denying that God has mercy and that God can forgive you? Well, I say maybe it could be denying that, but this denying of the power of God is denying the power of God to change and transform you that you can produce the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your mortal bodies. And that there is a holiness of God. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Holiness is more than a frame of mind. Holiness is more than an embrace of believing uh, in a state of holiness. Holiness is more than just God's rhetoric. I'm holy simply because God said I'm holy and it doesn't matter what I do. Holiness goes way beyond that. Holiness goes way beyond that. You have to perfect the holiness. It has to be produced in your righteous life by sin being overcome. That's the denying of the power of God that he's talking about here. Denying the power that I can live righteously, soberly, godly in this present world that we are to overcome sin in our flesh. Not by our own righteousness, but by faith in the operation of God. All right. And to, to prove the point, look at the context as he goes on. Who are these that are denying the form of godliness, denying the power thereof, of such of this sort? Are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led with, away with divers lusts, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth? So obviously he's talking about an outward manner of the practice of sin, right? An immorality here. Those are the ones who are denying the power because they carry on and leave captive the silly women and they go on like that. Now as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no for further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, and you know I'm always emphasizing the importance of doctrine. You can't have the unity of the spirit without the unity of the doctrine, because doctrine is, you know, is, is words that are preached and taught. And what are words? Words are spirit. Words are life. You can't separate the idea of doctrine and spirit. You can't ever separate the idea of unity of spirit with unity of doctrine. You don't have unity of spirit till you have unity of doctrine. You can't yield to a spirit of God, Christ that's in you because you have no ability to recognize what that spirit of Christ in you is trying to to uh, bring you to yield to. You have no ability to recognize that, what that Spirit of Christ is trying to say to you unless you receive doctrine and you can compare the doctrine to what's going on within you. And when you can see that the prompting and the unction and the impetus of the Spirit within you is trying to get you to do something, you can compare it to the doctrine and say, yes, that's the Spirit, I'll yield. So you can't do it without the doctrine. You can't do it. The Holy Ghost can be in you, but with no doctrine, there's no tool for the Holy Ghost to use. Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life. That's lifestyle. Purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of all of them, out of them all, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yeah, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. He was despised. He was rejected of men. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. And Hebrews 13 talks about the prophets and the patriarchs and the men of faith of old. They wandered around in sheepskins and so They were destitute, afflicted. Many are the afflictions, but the Lord delivers them out of 99% of them. Oh, God delivers you out of every single one. We have consolation and comfort of the scriptures where we can derive hope from these things. We derive hope in our affliction. Uh, blessed is a man who, passing through the valley of Baca, makes it a well. You know, Baca means affliction there, a valley of affliction, the valley of sorrow. Blessed is the man who, going through his affliction and his sorrow, has enough faith and enough communication with God that out of that affliction comes a well, wellspring of understanding of the things of God. Out of that affliction becomes a, a season of drawing intimate, intimate with the Lord Jesus Christ where he brings you personal visitations and confirms your soul and strengthens you and upholds you with the right hand of his righteousness. 
As Job said, thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. God will never leave you comfortless. God will never leave you comfortless. Never leave you comfortless. We've got to get the rejection thing right, and we've got to get the comfort thing right. Because if we're dealing with our rejection and the pain of our reje- rejection the wrong way, then we're receiving the wrong comfort. Yeah. And we're denying what Jesus said. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And that that's, what, that's the most precious times. Those are the most um, root and self-building times of confidence that you develop and develop more and more confidence with God when you come to that affliction, the place of loneliness, isolation, rejected, rejected of men, rejected of friends, rejected by your peers, rejected by even maybe your elders, by your teachers, by whatever you, whoever you're rejected by, and God comes and Jesus comes and He brings you the visitation. And He talks to you. He says, no, you're my son. Son, son, not nice when God always calls you son, right? Because then you're a son. And that's what we want to be, sons and daughters of the living God. If any man touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you unto myself, and you shall be sons and daughters unto me. So we, we, there is a consolation in the scripture. There's a consolation with God, and that's something we want to exercise ourselves unto and deal with the rejection issue and what are we and, and, and the expectation of rejection, and I'll get into some rejection. When the sore of rejection gets worse and worse, um, then the soul gets sick, and then expectations get skewed, and then things get uh, things get worse from there. So whenever we do sin against God, it's because we have a wound in our soul, a wound of rejection, a wound of bitterness. A pain, a sore. When any man shall know, you know, come to himself and spread forth his hands and confess his sin, when every man shall know his own sore and know his own grief. And that is the need that God sees in the soul. When you think of the song, he looks beyond the fault, he sees the need. The need is the healing of that rejection and that bitterness, and yet it cannot be a slight healing. You cannot slightly heal the rejection. It's just you can't just wash it over with you know a good feeling or a bottle of beer or smoke a joint or watch a TV show or whatever. You know you can't heal that thing slightly. You just can't uh, superficially uh, spread humanistic compassion and love one to another. Somehow we have to discover this deep root of uh, rejection and get it healed. But affliction is part of this uh, operation of God, and we can't get out of it. We can't circumvent it. We have to deal with it. All right. So Paul said, you know what persecutions, afflictions came unto me at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra. The Lord delivered me out of them all, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, now, um, I'm not against hierarchy, and you know I'm not against authority in the church, and you know as long as I've been active as a Christian, and active in ministry, or as a teacher, un- until these last couple of years, I have always been under another fleshly authority. I've always been under another fleshly authority. And so that's some 30-something, 30 35, 38 years of that. Okay, so I'm, I'm not just trying to say, I'm not trying to boast, I'm just trying to say I'm not a novice or I'm not a stranger to the idea that there's structure and hierarchy and authority in the body of Christ and everything else. All right, but I, I, do, I still, even then, uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul said to Timothy, he said, our brother Timothy is set at liberty. When you grow up into the fullness of the stature, 
then eventually you become led by the Spirit. Of course, you can't get to that stature until you first submit to people that you can't see. It's always the same thing with God. How do you love your bro- a God that you don't see unless you first can show that you love your brother who you do see, right? How can you say I'm faithful to God that I don't see if you are not faithful to the things that God gives you that you do see? You know, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife. It's, it's practiced, uh, those principles are practiced and perfected on the things that you see and then they're brought up into the higher into the spiritual realm. That's how it always works. So it's the same thing. Paul, and I, I would submit that Paul said, I preached, I did not, I, I, I strove not to preach where Christ was already named because I didn't want to build on another man's foundation. So if I came to a place and there's already a man preaching Christ there, Paul said, then I wasn't going to build on his foundation. I'll go somewhere else. Well, do you see what the implication of that is? The implication of that is there's other men that God had establishing the preaching of Christ in certain locations. And those men, God chose them. And those men were at liberty. They weren't particularly under the scrutiny of Paul's authority, were they? Paul just said, okay, they're... There's some place where Christ is already named. God's got a covered. I'll, I'll go somewhere else. Yes, he was the apostle of the Gentiles. But can a man grow up to stature and finally get to the place where, okay, you're, you've been at this for 30 years. You've been at this for 40 years. You've been at it for 50 years, cultivating your relationship. Now you're led of the Spirit. Now you're trustworthy. Now you can be led of the Spirit. You've successfully submitted yourselves to authorities in the flesh for the last umpteen years. And now... Uh, your submission has been uh, perfected and you're able to be led by the Spirit, you're at liberty. You see what I'm saying? That doesn't mean I'm against authority in the church. That doesn't mean if I come to another condition where I come to people, uh, another situation or another place where there's a church and there are men of authority higher than me, I will, I will, I will revert to submit under, under them again. But if I'm in a context or an environment or a condition where there, is, where there isn't anybody, I, I'm at liberty to conduct the exercise of my office. And liberty. Okay, so what I'm saying is that there is a time for every Christian where you have to have an experience that brings you nigh to God. And I'm prefacing and being careful. I'm not denying authority in the church. And I'm not saying you can deny authority in the church, but sometimes we get to conditions where God wants to deal with you as an individual. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 51. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone. alone. He said, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. I have called you by Name, individually, you. I've called you, individually, alone, by name. You're one of the hairs on the, his head that are all numbered. Yeah. Distinctive, individual. God knows you, remember? The Father himself loves you. The Father himself loves you. Because you believe that Jesus Christ is sent out from God, then you recognize the same image of Christ as it appeared in other men of God and through the body of Christ, and you still recognize that image of Christ, and you receive it when you, whenever you recognize it, you receive of it, and you follow after it, and you set to your seal that God is true, and your heart is fixed, determined to seek God in pursuit of eternal life, ready to lay down your life and give it up. And if you somehow can't seem to give it up, you're still willing to acknowledge, I ought to be able to give it up, and God, would you please help me? And even from that position, God will help you and honor you that in that as well. How does God help you give up things? Well, He makes those things that you can't give up, He makes them the cause of your affliction. It makes it more, more vexing and more troublesome and more vexing and more uh, afflicting and... You know, until you just have enough, right? And then you, it overwhelms you, and you, you just, your heart finally recognizes the improfitability of things. I think I, Jose, uh, Isaiah said that you'll take your things that were your idols, and eventually you'll, you'll cast them away like a menstruous cloth. You know, get thee hence. What, what in the world am I doing in this? ungodly activity here. 
suddenly realizing maybe your epiphany moment, right? Your sudden suddenly comes to you. I mean, I think this brother Al I talked about the when he was an alcoholic and he was drinking, you know, he got to the point where it was such an affliction to him, he cursed that bottle, right? He cursed it. Now we know alcohol is not a personality or anything, but there is a spirit behind it. But you know, he cursed it. He said, I curse you, you you, uh, they call it spirits. Yeah, they call it spirits, alcohol. They call it spirits. But anyway, you know, that's what he got to the point. He got so vexed and frustrated, he was ready to cast it away. Get away from me, you cursed thing. You're wrecking my life. Well, that's what we have to come to with our vices and our idols. All right, so where am I? Isaiah 51. God calls Abraham alone. So that's a characteristic of everybody's calling. Somewhere you have to know that God deals with you individually alone. And that, see, that, that is higher than, that transcends, that excludes all flesh. Even, even, even authorities in the church. Those experiences go beyond even fleshly authorities in the church. It doesn't eliminate their influence. It doesn't mean that you're never, you'd never be subject to them anymore. But you're going to have to have experiences that go beyond that. Bible's very clear. There's going to be men of authority, right? Ministers, evangelists, prophets, whatever. Paul warned, if we are an angel of heaven, come preach any other gospel, then be accursed. You know all the patterns of the Old Testament of a prophet comes and preaches a sign or wonder, doesn't come to pass, and you shall not hearken unto that prophet because the Lord proves you, and so on and so forth. Is there a time when God's going to prove you whether you honor God and honor His Word above all things. And we said it before, when, when uh, prophets are in perversion, that's the pattern of Balaam. That's when the, the dumbass sees the spirit of holiness and a prophet in perversion doesn't. He doesn't see it. The dumbass sees something that the higher in authority doesn't see because the perversion blinds him. So instinctively, the dumbass just doesn't, doesn't doesn't just blindly follow the authority of, of the prophet in his perversion. He won't, won't do it. Dumbass won't do it. Why? Well, one, the dumbass was actually trying to protect the prophet. Maybe he's not so dumb. <laughs> yeah, not, he's not so dumb. Yeah. Dumb as he can't speak. Well, one day God opens the dumbass's mouth and he speaks. He speaks with man's voice, you see. He speaks with authority. He speaks with purity. He speaks with uh, comprehension. He speaks with man's voice. Not just idle words, flippy words out of his mouth, but... All right, so there's all of that. Now, I'm saying that because I'm going to get to something here in Isaiah 53. Well, here's the pattern. Look unto, uh, unto the rock from whence you are hewn. Abraham is the father of our faith, right? He's the father of our faith. He was the first man to have a promise with God. And God enters into a covenant or a promise with you. And he calls you alone. And I always thank God that I had a, a vivid enough experience in my calling that before there was ever any man of God over me, I'm not whoever the man of God is, and I've been under a number of them, they weren't a part of that experience I had. That was me laying upon my bed, reading the scriptures with the Holy Ghost coming upon me, telling me what he called me to do. And that was my own personal God calling me alone. Alone. And Sarah is the church, the woman that bears. For I call them alone, bless them, increase them. The Lord shall comfort Zion. He shall comfort all her waste places. He will make his wil her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found there, and thanksgiving in the voice of melody. Hearken unto me, my people. Give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me. Not, not the law of Moses, but a law. See, the law of God, the law of Christ, the law of charity. Like we're no longer under the law of Moses, but we're not without a law unto God. A standard, a law. A cause and effect, a spiritual cause and effect that's upon us. And I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. So when God comes and he makes judgment, remember judgment doesn't always mean for evil or good necessarily. Judgment just simply means bringing to light. Right? If I did something good and nobody knows about it and the work is hid, judgment may come to reveal, hey, this man did a good deed and everybody 
should know about it. So that's judgment. It doesn't mean condemnation or penalty necessarily. Or maybe I did something very wicked and evil and nobody knows about it and it's hid. And judgment comes and reveals I did this evil deed. And so judgment could go either way. Judgment is light. Judgment is light. So for us, our judgment, whether we do right or wrong, as long as we're in the operation of God, as long as we are in the law of Christ, as long as we're walking according to what we have attained, as long as we're not deliberately, provisionally, excessively, purposefully striving towards sin and sinning on purpose all the time, if we're not doing any of those things, then God's judgment will always be an enlightenment to us. Always be an enlightenment. Enlightenment. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth. Mine arms shall judge the people. The isle shall wait upon me, and on mine arms shall they trust Lift up your eyes to the heavens, look unto the earth beneath. The heavens shall vanish away like smoke, the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Go ahead, look up at the stars in the sky. Look, look at everything. It's all going to pass away. Hearken unto me, you that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear you not the reproach of men. See, God's dealing with the rejection issue you're going to be reproached by men don't fear that don't fear the reproach of men neither be ye afraid of their revilings the moth shall eat them up like a garment and the worm shall eat them like wool my righteousness shall be forever my salvation from generation to generation awake awake put on strength O arm of the lord awake as in the ancient days and the generations of old art thou not it that hath cut rahab and wounded the dragon Art thou not it which hath dried the sea in the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransomed to pass over? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. And God wants to comfort His people who have embraced this covenant, who are embracing the fact that we are trying to endure their afflictions. And trying to make sure their hope and trust is in God. And that their acceptance comes from God and not, not from men. Right? Now, Pharisees believed Jesus to a certain point, didn't they? But what did they love more? They loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. So set your heart on the praises of God. Set, the, set, your, set your heart on the honor that comes from God. How can you believe ye that seek honor one from another and you seek not the honor that comes from God? I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be of, of, afraid of a man that shall die and of the Son of Man which shall be made as grass and forgettest the Lord thy Maker? And here's what I'm saying. I'm not against authority. I'm not against men of God. But there comes a time of affliction. There comes a time of testing. There comes a season of rejecting that you're going to have to put your focus on the Lord Himself. And God's going to tell you. So you, you can fear men of God to a certain level, but then you've got to fear God more than that. You can honor God of men to a, a certain level, but in times of peril and perversion, and provocation from every position in the body of Christ. You have to embrace and honor the word of God above all. And sometimes, and it's not like this all the time, but sometimes we come to that. And this is what God will say to you in those seasons. And this is what God said to me many times in the last two, three years. He said, who are you? I'm trying to comfort you. Who are you that, that you're afraid of a man is just going to die? And you're afraid of a son of man. I'm, he's just going to be made like the grass. And you forget me. I'm the Lord your maker. I'm the one who called you all alone when you're laying upon your bed. I'm the Lord your God. I'm, I'm, I'm your father and you're my son. I know you. You are mine. Father himself loves me. You understand what I'm saying? That goes beyond any worldly, fleshly authority. Well, and sometimes, you know how it is, um, if someone's trying to hold, someone in, in their, uh, if some authority of the flesh is trying to hold power of, o over you, they're not doing it entirely in righteousness. And believe me, that happens. That does happen. 
because everybody's at different levels of having attained and being perfected and whatever. And then you you show a certain root in self, right? You show a certain root in self. Well, that an authority in the flesh might think, well, you're a rebel. But maybe you're not a rebel. It depends. <laughs> it really depends. Do you think Balaam thought the dumbass was rebellious? He surely did. The old dumbass wasn't doing what Balaam wanted. The old dumbass wasn't going where Balaam wanted to go. Right? So what did he do? Well, he beat the ass. He beat it. Just kept beating it. And what was Balaam's problem? They ran greedily after the error of Balaam. How was Balaam enticed? Oh, come Balaam, I will promote you to great honor. The acceptance, acceptance of men. Well, if you're already accepted by God, and if you have no rejection in your heart, who needs the acceptance of men? How can you be enticed? Now, it's an easy thing to say and a harder thing to walk after. But I'm saying, there's your goal. There's your goal. Right? There's your goal. That's why the devil had no nothing in Jesus. Jesus said, I don't receive honor from men. That's not what I'm looking for. People get all put off when they... When suddenly you don't, you know, you don't care if they're accept, with, uh, you don't care if you have their acceptance or not. Now, amongst brethren, I, I do care that I have my brother and my sister's acceptance because, to a certain degree, that represents acceptance from God also because Christ is in you. You understand? So there's a degree of that. There's a degree of that. We're not throwing that out. But I'm talking about a personal root and self, and this is what how God dealt with me over the last couple of years. Who art, who art thou that thou should be afraid, afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man, which shall be made as grass? Now, men of authority can bring some pretty heavy threats on you, and they can do it under the guise of being uh, having authority and anointing from God, because God does give those men authority and anointing. What did Matthew 23 said? The scribes and the Pharisees are in these positions of power. They sit in Moses' seat. They sit as judges. All that they therefore did you do, that observe and do, but don't do after their works. But I'm talking even about something even beyond that. Even something beyond that. I'm talking about something whereby it turns into something that is perverse and then it becomes, as we've been saying all along over the past weeks and months and stuff, it becomes threatenings and slanders and accusations and challenges against your integrity, contradictions of sinning people against your own integrity. You know, consider him which endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Right. Now, this is a tricky thing because God's going to indict our sin and our iniquity. We're going to have to come to acknowledge. But there comes a time that we're just being falsely accused and slandered and our integrity is being challenged. That's the time when God says, I am he that comforts you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that die, and of the son of man which shall be made as grass? Jesus go, even goes beyond the son of man here. goes beyond that. And you forget who? The Lord your maker that stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth. And you fear continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? I'll speak for myself. You know, I was very, very um, fearful, you know, whether I was lost or whether it was the end of the road for ministry or as a Christian because I got put out of Christian fellowship or left Christian fellowship and all of that kind of stuff. And I was fearful. Is the world going to swallow me up? Is God going to bring me through okay? Am I going to... Uh, you know, what, what, what comes from here? I had no idea. And then day after day, week after week, year after year, and you're still here. And like I said, and here we are in this practice and exercise. And God's saying, well, where, where is the fury of this oppressor? Where is his threats like a roaring lion? See, they never came to pass. As the proverb says, the curse causeless, it's not going to come. If I have root myself and I'm led of the Spirit, they can all charge me and threaten me with damnation Ichabod, you're cursed, you're this, you're that. God cuts you off. They can say whatever they want. As I said before, what's my justification? How was Jesus justified? He was raised again for our justification. So the resurrection, as I said before, yeah, I was killed and put to death as a teacher in certain fellowships, and I had to leave. And then that was the death, so to speak, of the function and role of my calling. But 
Did God resurrect it again? Yeah, God resurrected it again. So what's that saying? God justified me. He justified me. So that, that is an experience that bolsters and strengthens my root and self with God. So I'm sorry, no, disrespect, no disrespect to higher authorities in the flesh or anything, really. And wherever I can honor them, I, I will endeavor to honor them. As far as your threats and slanders and challenges and accusations, uh, go ahead. I'm dead to it. Go ahead. I don't, I don't care. I don't care what you think about me. I know what God has done. I know what God's declaration is by virtue of how he's let the resurrection of the ministry come to pass. That's my justification. I don't need it from men, any man, and it doesn't mean I'm. I can sit. Uh, it doesn't mean I can sit alone apart from the body of Christ. It, it doesn't mean that I have to. That I can now stop acknowledging men of authority. I'm just saying, here's a here's a condition in the operation of God where you go through rejection and affliction, and everybody, in order to come to know God for yourself, as the Bible says, and they shall no more say, "Know the Lord." They'll all know me from the least to the greatest. And they shall all be taught by, all be taught by, all be taught by God, 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 the Father. And it goes beyond all flesh. And that's not blasphemous. And it's not a disregard or a disacknowledging of authority that God sends in the flesh. This is simply the part of the operation of God whereby every individual gets to know God for themselves. And you have to go through it. Get your root in self. Now, where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive ex exile. The captive exile. Exile. Do we ever feel exiled? Like we were in a fellowship and we had to leave or you were kicked out and then you're kind of left stranded alone off somewhere in the world. It's like I said, like we've always been saying, this is like being persecuted to a strange city. This is like being trying to be saved by grabbing onto broken pieces, pieces of the broken ship, the broken fellowship, like we're exiled. Well, the captive... And yet we're the Lord's captive, and yet we're exiled from other Christians and other aspects of Christian fellowship that we used to be in. The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit, nor that his bread should fail. Well, I'm kind of speaking for myself, because that's, this, is, this is my experience. That's how I felt. Can you imagine, right? A teacher, and then no longer in fellowship, not knowing what your outcome is going to be. You're in exile, you're captive. You wish you could be loosed in your calling, but you're in a season where you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if maybe the world and the spirit of the world is going to overwhelm you, overcome you, and you get swallowed up in a bunch of sinful activities, or whether God's going to keep you or not, or because you, you don't know your, your own state, you don't know your own strength, your own weakness. And yet, so this is the condition of your heart in, the, in that time. You're hoping that you could be loosed. You don't want to die in the pit, and you don't want your bread to fail. You want to fulfill your ministry, in other words. But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose waves roared, the Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand, and that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling, and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth, neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. These two things are come unto thee, who shall be sorry for thee, desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword, by whom sh uh, shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted, they lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord and the rebuke of thy God. Therefore hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. So you're drunk, but you're not drunk with wine. You're not drunk with pleasure. You're not drunk with the excess of this life. You know, you're not drunk in the cares of life, in pursuits of pleasure. You are drunken in your affliction. In other words, there's so much affliction and sorrow and pain that you're just simply distracted, drunken in it. Thus saith the Lord thy God, Hear now this thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith the Lord thy God, the God that pleadeth the cause of his people. You think God isn't going to Plead the cause of his people. You know, that widow woman who prays. And, Avenge me of my adversaries. Um, don't bother me. Door shut. I'm with my children. Don't bother me. And she kept, kept pleading and pleading and pleading. He said, not because of, of her, but because of her importunity. This is the, what, the parable of the unjust. I got, I'm conflating two stories together. But the judge, the unjust judge. Yeah. Wearies him with her much. Comfort. She wearies him with her much. 
And shall not God avenge his elect, who cry unto him day and night? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Thus saith the Lord that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again, but I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, Bow down that we may go over, and thou hast laid thy body as the ground, and as the street to them that went over. This is talking to a bunch of people that for their conscience towards God, because they believe in God, and count it so important, their testimony so important, because of their conscience towards God, they actually submitted themselves to be afflicted by others who were perverse. And their perversion was expressed and promoted as they trampled down on you to do it. And the Bible says, well, I'm going to put that affliction into their hands now. Okay? So in other words, you're uh, for... For uh, conscience towards God. If you, because of conscience towards God, endure grief, then that is acceptable with God. But to be able to do such a thing, you have to be uh, established within yourself. You have to have that root in yourself. Now, the issue of rejection and bitterness. And you know I always um, start from Acts chapter 8 with Simon the uh, sorcerer. Acts 8 and 9, there was a certain man called Simon, which before in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, given out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized men and women. Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. And when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answers, Pray to ye to the Lord, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So Simon was declared to be in the uh, gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity from that scripture you know how I, I teach it the gall of bitterness is what bonds you to your iniquity it's the gall of bitterness again back to the feelings of pain wound, rejection, alienation isolation, affliction, torment grief, sorrow anguish all that painful the pains of hell making you desperate to relieve the pain, desperate to reconnect, not to be isolated or all alone or isolated. You know, it compels you to try to get acceptance, to belong to something so that you're not alone. It's not good that a man should be alone. Well, not just in reference to marriage or a man and a woman, but it's just not good for a man to be isolated and alone or a woman or, or a saint or anybody. We have to have identification with each other and identification with Jesus Christ, right? That's our identity. That's our family name by whom the whole uh, family in heaven and earth is named. Your identification is with Jesus Christ. Your honor comes from Christ, from God, where we're after. For you are accepted in the beloved. That has to reach the heart somewhere. For you are accepted. You are accepted. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. If thou doest not well, Sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. So if the pain and feeling of rejection has you pursuing the acceptance of men, I mean, this is the basic concept behind peer pressure. When you're a teenager, hey, I, I, was, I had no ambitions to smoke marijuana, but all the guys that I was hanging around with were smoking marijuana. And if I didn't want to be rejected, oh, come on, man, come on, man, smoke this joint. Come on with us. Ah, come on, you sis, you don't want to do it, huh? Ah, you, you goof, you, you this, you that. I'm going to be taunted and rejected by my friends. So the fear of being rejected 
compels me to do something I wouldn't normally do. It compels me. The Bible says all their lifetime were subject to bondage through fear of death, fear of rejection, because rejection is the death. Rejection is the death. You know, God says that, uh, Jesus says in Revelation, uh, I'll receive you and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. So God has a book of life. And simply what it means is, if you are in God's book of life, that means you are a part of God's life because God accepts you. God receives you. And God honors you because you honor Him, of course. Right? If any man will honor me, Jesus said, Him my Father will honor. So you're accepted of God. You're in the book. Now what if you follow on and you start dishonoring God? He says, oh, I've got to blot the name out of the book that I have written. Your name was in, but now I'm going to blot it out. So man, who is made in the image, pattern and image and glory of God, man's behavior and man's character runs a parallel pattern with God, albeit now in a sinful state it's kind of a perverted pattern, but the, it is a pattern nonetheless. I am, I, am a, I am a man, I am a Christian, and I have my book of life. If I accept you... If we're friends, I accept you and honor you and and treat your fellowship, you're in my book of life. If I scorn you and accuse you and reject you and not nothing to do with you, well, I blotted you out of my own little personal book of life, right? So it's the book of life. Acceptance and rejection. Boils down to that. Acceptance and rejection. Simon the Sorcerer. It looks like to point out, Simon the Sorcerer, you know, often people think of bitterness as having a cross brow and being cynical and... and disgruntled and uh, miserable uh, miserable countenance and uh, grumbling and so forth. But that was not the manifestation of Simon the sorcerer's bitterness. What was the manifestation of his bitterness? Is He wanted to be a great one. He, fought, he saw the signs and miracles. That's what he saw. He said, oh, give me money. That I'll give you money. Whoever I lay my hands on, they may receive the Holy Ghost. At face value on the surface, you might think... Uh, Oh, what, what a noble man. He wants people to get uh, blessed by, with the Holy Ghost. What a great guy. Oh, sure, now give me $1,000 and I'll give you the power. That's not how it went. See, Simon may even come off religiously as some man earnest, earnestly wanting to do a, a, a spiritual work for God. But why do you want to do a spiritual work for God? Is it because it was his ticket to acceptance from men by the demonstration of the miracle? Yeah, don't rejoice because the devils are subject to you or because you see some notable miracle. No. Rejoice that your names are written down in the Lamb's book of life that you have been chosen and accepted by God and meditate on that. Get, let that get down in your heart. Never mind the miracles and the signs and the wonders because that is a drawing card for people who are seeking self-exaltation and glory. That's, a Balaam's, what, that's why Balaam got perverse. I'll promote you to great honor, the king of Balak says. I'll promote you to honor. You'll have all these men admire you. And he said, okay, let's go. You know, well, first he didn't. First God told him, don't go. Then they came the second time. You know, Each time, the first time Balak comes to Balaam, he says, wait here and I'll ask God. And God says, don't go with the men. But then uh, Balak sends more and more honorable messengers and entices them again. And so Balaam says the second time, just wait here, I'll go ask God again. And I've always said, well, why do you have to go ask God again? Didn't you hear what he said the first time? Didn't you hear what God said the first time? Don't go with him. Why do you have to ask God the second time? That's because there's something in his heart that wanted to go. He was being enticed by the promotion of honor among men. And then so God finally says to him, go, right? And then God got angry when he went. I remember reading that as a young Christian saying, well, God, first God tells him to go, and then he gets mad because he goes. But, you know, what's hidden in there is God, okay, okay, if that idolatry is in heart, you want the praises of men, I already told you no, and you won't accept no for an answer, then go ahead then. Go ahead. Get yourself in trouble. That's basically what God's saying. Go ahead then. And then when he goes, his anger is kindled because he went. You know, at that point, he could have said, wow, well, 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 maybe I really shouldn't go. <laughs> no, but Balaam went. He was enticed. Okay, but everybody needs honor. Remember, everybody needs honor. Everybody needs acceptance. Honor and acceptance is the only antidote to pain and rejection. But what honor are you, what honor are you seeking? To those who by patient continuance seeks for honor and immortality and eternal life and the honor that comes from God and you're doing it patiently and you're diligent trying to build up strength to re- re- reject the praises of men and the, get the praises of God. Now, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, 
precious elect. He was rejected of men, but chosen of God. Isaiah 53, as we've been saying, he was despised, rejected, a man acquainted with griefs and sorrows, despised, oppressed, afflicted, but accepted by God. Accepted by God. That's all you need. And you are complete in Him. You, you know you're in Him. And you know He is in you when you have this kind of root and self. Now, I don't care what people think. I don't have to scramble to change my conduct duct, and, and, and uh, capitulate to everybody's Desire to say, to, 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 to keep their acceptance and, you know, that's a terrible bondage to be in. Of course, we do want to honor one another as people of God, right? But I'm saying men, carnal men, the carnal man, the honor that comes from men. That's the key here. That's the key. Rejection. Now, so Simon was a man that had a root of rejection and he was trying to appease it by receiving the honor that comes from men. Now, I've heard this, uh, I read an article, of course, I, be I believe it. So, this is the perilous times. I'll get back to that in a minute, okay? I'm going to talk about Elvis Presley and his quest for acceptance and his root of rejection, which is typical amongst all, I all movie stars, music stars. Rejection is common. Rejection is common. We all have rejection. If you are the elect of God, then God makes sure you never... Sat, get satisfied or content or you never seem to fit in or get accepted ultimately by the world because if you did then you'd leave off your acceptance from God you know like I tried to get acceptance a lot of different ways I tried to get acceptance by joining in the drug crowd when I was young I tried to get acceptance by being a musician and aspiring rock star I tried to get acceptance this that, and the other thing and so to a degree it kind of worked and it kind of didn't And but it is never Never satisfied, always had to look for something else. Some people grow content in their pursuit of worldly honor, and so then they leave off seeking the honor that comes from God. But not in the Christian. God is going to afflict you until you get it, get the, get it right with Him and get uh, your root and self with Him. Now, many shall be offended, many shall betray one another, many shall hate one another, many false prophets shall rise and deceive many, iniquity abounds, the love of many shall wax cold. We are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives us into putting hope and trust and getting honor and acceptance from, from things that are not godly sources of honor and acceptance. And trying to get acceptance and honor from people who don't even have the capability of giving us the honor and acceptance that we need. And then when we think we get it and then we don't get it and we find out we've been duped, our hearts get hardened against true love and true honor and true acceptance. We get hardened, cynical, we get less and less, we believe less and less and less in those things that it's possible. You know how, uh, I, I quote that Tina Turner, was a Tina Turner song, What's Love Got to Do With It? What's love but a second-hand emotion? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? People who try to pursue love and acceptance and honor towards one another, they did it without God, it didn't work. And their hearts got cynical and hardened. And then you stop believing in love. You stop believing in honor. You stop believing in life. You stop believing in that stuff. And you withdraw within yourself to try to protect yourself from ever being hurt again. Well, you're just building a wall of isolation. Separating yourself further. Separating yourself further. This is why you got to watch it. you got to watch anything the devil does to separate the body of Christ. Anything he does. Anything he does to separate it. Can't do it. There's no such thing as... Um, independence in the body of Christ. Some people think they make it alone, they think they're strong because they can make it alone or whatever they think. You know, they, they, they mistake their mistaken strength for independence. They're not strong, they're independent. Well, you can't be independent with God. Impossible. You cannot be independent. I heard men say, well, I thank God for the independent ministries that, that are in the body of Christ. No, there's no independent ministries. Interdependent ministries is all there are. We are fellow workers. Even the minister that I'm not in physical contact with. I need him and he needs me and we're ministers together. And even the ministry that I don't have, ministers that I don't have physical rapport or contact with, I still sometimes check in with those guys to make sure we're speaking the same things and got our consistency in doctrine and execution of counsel. Well, so many are offended, hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, reluctant to, reluctant to love, reluctant to trust, reluctant to submit, reluctant to receive the exchange of love and honor. Because in the past, it was the cause of grief and pain and rejection. Trying to protect yourself from the pain. 
But here's what I'm saying. You can't circumvent it. Right? You can't circumvent it. There are three people on the cross. One was bitter. One was contrite and repentant. And of course, the third was Jesus, suffering for righteousness sake. And that's our little pattern. It's our little picture. What is the cross? Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. The cross was a tree. Well, Jesus puts the spittle on the man's eyes and he says, Oh, I see men as trees walking. Isaiah says, You are the trees of righteousness. We're trees. So what is the tree? The tree is the flesh. Your flesh is the cross. Where do you suffer? You suffer in the flesh. Is Jesus suffering? Not now, because he's in a glorified body, glorified to be made a high priest. When? Where did he do all his suffering? Right here on earth in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's where his suffering is. That's where his cross was. That's where yours is. Everybody in the world bears a cross. Remember Paul? He said, uh, I glory, uh, God forbid I should glory saving the cross of Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified to me and I'm crucified to the, the whole world's on a cross. You don't see the world suffering. You don't see the distress of nations with perplexity. You don't see famines and earthquakes, pestilences and vexations and anguish all over the world. Everybody's on a cross. You're not going to circumvent it. We're not going to circumvent it. All right. Iniquity abounds. So what I'm saying is we've been hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And the hardness has to break down so that you can know that you're accepted by God. Deal with the rejection issue by being, by striving to establish the deep heartfelt root that you know you're accepted of God. Then the Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. You shall not need you shall not that that's jesus jesus in the fullness of stature i receive not honor from men he did receive honor though not from men jeremiah 9 forces take ye heed every one his neighbor and trust ye not in any any brother for every brother will utterly supplant and every neighbor will walk with slanders you know i don't believe that's an absolute i don't believe that's all the time but i think all of us have been in situations where we're amongst people christians and there's those who say they're christians and they're walking with slanders even your neighbor even your brother. This is the perilous time. That's what I'm saying. This is the perilous time. Take heed. Perilous time shall come. This is the flower and the epitome of self, selfish, wounded, iniquitous, offended and being offended and all of that. So it's the call to charity, right? True charity. Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and he needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. So do we all know what's in the old man? Sin, Deceit. Our hearts are seeking rest, peace, completeness, oneness, atonement. And we're seeking it because of our condition of being in the gall of bitterness. Alone. Separated. Isolated. Wounded. Painful. So we're looking for a security, right? We're looking for a safe place. A place of rest. Where there's no rejection. No betrayal. No sorrow. There's only one place you're going to find it. It's in Jesus Christ. It's in that relationship in between your own heart and Jesus Christ. Okay, um, the carnal man's idea of security and safety is to build a wall of protection around itself to try to prevent any further bitter experiences. But I'm saying that's wrong because for the Christian it's wrong because this is what we're called to. We're called to rejection. Uh, there remaineth a rest to the people of God. Psalm 107, 30 says, Then they are glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Our desired haven is to be at rest and peace with God. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, um, the more you are rejected by the world and think you're, or think you're being rejected by the world, and the more this goes on outside of Christ, I mean, just as, as a carnal man, then the more you get strengthened in the expectation of that rejection. Of course, we talk, talked about expectations a lot. How do you set your expectation? And I'm going to talk about the expectation of rejection getting stronger and stronger in the evil sense. Expecting rejection. And when the expectation grows stronger and stronger and stronger, and when the heart actually gets sick in that expectation, then the heart already pre-concludes that it's going to be rejected before it has actually been rejected. So you're going to feel rejected on the basis of just simply you expect it to happen. So you count it as happening even before it happens. What that means is there are going to be conditions where people are not actually rejecting you like you expect. But your expectation is so strong 
the voice of it is so loud in your spirit and heart that you count it as a rejection when it isn't. That's when you are, the old man is, is very sick. His soul is sick in the expectation of rejection. He's counting it before it happens. It's, it's a presump, presumptive thing to a degree. Okay, And then expectation is a part of faith, isn't it? You know, Job says, that which I feared the most or expected the most. Yeah, when you expect something more and more and more, your confidence grows, that, uh, your confidence grows in it. You, you can become more and more convinced. So expectation is like having faith. And then you begin, you begin having great faith that you're going to be rejected. Yeah. Well then, but as a principle, that's not necessarily wrong because as a Christian, you're going to be rejected. But if it's the old man's expectation and he's holding that expectation of rejection in a kind of a cynical way, then that is not good. Okay, I'm, I'm making a distinction there. Well, according to your faith, be it unto you. Believing motivates a spiritual force. It releases that spiritual force in you. It's faith that releases the power of God. It's fear or believing in, not believing in God, believing in something else, releases that power to help it come to pass. If you, if you fear and expect rejection intensely, more and more and more, in greater and greater degree, the more you're convinced, the more you release the power to actually bring it to pass. And I'm, so that's a bottom line spiritual force where it looses the power of Christ or Antichrist through your regard for the one or the other. Now I've said this before recently too, if, if I'm full of the expectation of rejection and I meet someone else full of the expectation of rejection and I'm so full of the expectation of rejection that I already conclude that I'm going to be rejected even before I actually judge the situation or judge the person. I'm expecting it that any little thing will convince me. It's like I said before. So I, the expectation of rejection is an issue. It's a spirit and it emanates. I'm expecting to be rejected. That expectation of rejection is an issue that emanates off of me and begins to affect the other person. It affects their mind. The spirit itself, without me saying anything, my mannerism, the expression on my face, it's going to express to them my expectation of rejection and it's going to throw the other guy off so that he sees the sour look on my face the expectation of rejection i'm already convinced i'm going to be rejected so therefore i'm i'm already closed off in my heart and that spirit communicates to the other person that hey that guy's closed off in his heart so what does he do he rejects me he doesn't want to say good morning because he sees the look on my face he senses the expectation of rejection and it makes it makes the encounter awkward so he's not open to greet me and what if you, what if the other man has the same rejection same degree same issue of rejection it's, this is like similar poles of a magnet repelling each other yeah uh, yeah see look at him i can tell by looking at his face he doesn't want nothing to do with me and the, the other guy's saying the same thing yeah look look on his face he doesn't want nothing to do with me either Re rejection similar poles of a magnet pushing each other apart that's how it works in the spiritual realm because the invisible things like magnetism, they are allegories for spiritual works. So what happens is you actually become full of confidence that you're going to be rejected. So if I think you're going to reject me and I'm convinced of it before anything ever happens, you may not be rejecting me. It may be my own expectations skewing my, skewing my judgments. Right? And then if you are not rejecting me, then what I'm actually doing in my rejection is I'm, a, I'm accusing you of rejecting me when you're not. See, now I, that rejection is bringing a charge on my brother. I'm casting a charge on my brother. Kind of like rejection goes two ways. Yeah, it's going two ways. But here's the thing. Three things the earth cannot bear. Four that never says it's enough. You know, the fire or four that they cannot bear. As that proverb goes, the fire that saith not it is enough. There's a fire that never says is en enough. Someone who becomes fully persuaded in this kind of rejection and fully hardened into it is always going to presuppose the rejection even when the rejection isn't there and there's nothing you can do to appease that heart. It is already decided to be rejected before the fact and there's nothing you can do to appease it because it will take everything, good and evil, by the time it goes through their expectations to them, they'll make it into some kind of act of rejection. Inaccurately, wrongfully. This is where I want to get into the Elvis example. 
All right. When Elvis Presley, before he died in his later years and touring on the road and doing shows and everything and performing, the people who were backstage with him, he would go out on stage and everybody would just go nuts, right? They would cheer him and adore him and sing his praises and just completely enthralled with the man. Like he's Elvis, the king, right? The king of rock and roll. So they would idolize him, adore him with genuine, enthusiastic response all the way through. Then he'd go backstage, berate and bitter, bitterly swear and curse his fans. Call them names and just curse them with profanities and everything else. Curse them as though he was being rejected. Well, he wasn't being rejected. He was being enthusiastically received as an idol. And yet that man's heart was so full of rejection that none of the praises of all those men couldn't reach or satisfy his heart. You see, nothing could appease that man in his rejection. Nothing, nothing could appease it. So the man that wants praise or response out of you, that's actually full of rejection, you can give him exactly what he's describing. You can give him everything that he claims he wants. He'll still call you. He'll still curse you. He'll still put you down. He'll berate you and claim that you're rejecting him because he already decided on the rejection and concluded it before he ever came out on the stage. Right, he's actually charging you with rejecting him before, before there's any case, before there's any evidence, before there's any performance, before there's any manifestation of anything. It's being convinced of your expectations above and beyond what the reality is saying. You know, that's what paranoia is. Paranoia is, you know, you're afraid everybody's out to get you and you believe that according to your expectation. Even everybody is not out to get you. You believe it according to the expectation, not according to what's actually happening. Not according to the evidence. Not according to the manifestation of things. You're, you're believing it according to your expectation because that expectation is so loud, let's say, such a big voice in your mind. As the joke goes, the, the paranoid person says, oh, I'm not paranoid. Everybody really is out to get me. That's what they believe. So to them, it, that's, it, that's the way it is. Even if you're not out to get them, it's concluded on the basis of the intensity of the expectation. So the, the expectation becomes their reality, and reality is missed, not perceived. And that's the way rejection gets when it gets really bad. And the tragedy of rejection is someone full of rejection really needs to be known, known that they're accepted by God ultimately, if it's possible. And yet, if they don't, if they get their acceptance from every other source or if they get their comfort from every other, other source and keep rejecting and refusing the provision of God for honor, re refusing the provision of God for comfort, they will grow and grow and grow in their cynicism and they will charge the people outside of them all the time and, and be blind about their own need. And God forbid that someone should get locked in that kind of chain of darkness. Because re rejection is a horrible thing. It needs to, it need, rejection is, person in rejection is a person in need. And of course a per person is in need is a person who is wounded. Now here's another thing. Just because you're wounded doesn't always need, mean that you need com compassion at a, any particular time. Talk about the slightly, uh, slightly healing the wound of my people. Well, how about Sodom and Gomorrah? Were they wounded? They were wounded. The cry of Sodom has come up before me, and their sin is really grievous. I mean, this is really grievous stuff going down there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're wounded, and their wounds are making them cry, and their cry has come up before me. It wasn't a cry of repentance, right? It wasn't. It wasn't a cry of repentance. It was a cry of torment. It was maybe a cry of grudging against everything and everybody all around them. Maybe it was a uh, cry of grudge and grievance and complaint and what have you. When every man shall know his own sort, his own grief. Okay, and then this is the, ties into the principle we visit once in a while, from time to time. Nothing from without entering into a man, but that which comes up out of the heart of man, that's what defiles him. It's how, how you react to the afflictions and the offenses that are coming at you or into you. Well, you see the simplicity of the principle. I'm not saying it's an easy thing to attain, because the heart is a complex thing and roots of uh, bitterness and galls of bitterness and bonds of iniquity and things are very complicated webs of counsels and experiences that have been interwoven in the heart and that go very, 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 very deep. So it takes time to unravel those things and to set the soul free. But in principle, do you see the simplicity of the principle? If I have honor from men, I don't need honor from God, right? Well, then I won't get all bent out of shape with men reject me. I mean, I won't 
I won't be driven and compelled for the acceptance of men. I won't be, you know, driven to pursue every kind of false comfort there is. It's a fundamental thing. It's something to stick in your craw there and something to put it as frontlets before your eyes and think about it. Think about this stuff all the time because that's, that's our real key to being set free. And when you're in the gall of bitterness, you know, our tendency is in, in bitterness. We were wounded, we're betrayed, we're all offended. And the tendency is to lay charge, right? Lay charge on someone. Why like they, they took me for all my money. They took advantage of me. and They cheated on me. They did this to me. They, and maybe they did do all those things. But regardless, coming back down to fundamentals, the key to all of our, the key to all of our liberty from all of our influence of sin and iniquity has to be you forgive them. You don't hold that. Because the bond of iniquity, the bitter roots, the feelings of pain, and if the charge is on an individual, then that is what opens your heart, heart, opens your heart to receive the counsel that, you know, you were wrong done by, you, you, therefore you have a right to set them straight. You have a right to take vengeance. You have a right to be angry at them. You have a right... Like you, you need you need to be comforted. You have a right to go do this and smoke this, drink this, eat this, sleep with him, sleep with her, whatever, whatever your comfort is. That's how you justify it in your own self. It's justified in your own self based on your own gall of bitterness. But if you let the bitterness go and you forgive and you ascribe it all to God's work for the overall glory of God, and it's not the individual's fault, you you forgive. You have no more excuse to pursue the false comforts, the vengeance, the hatred, the murder, the false charges. There's, there's nothing worse than a man full of rejection who cannot be appeased. You know, Romans says that they're traitors, heady, high miners, or whatever they says, fierce, incontinent, uh, implacable, unmerciful. Implacable, unmerciful. A man driven and locked into his own rejection and his own expectation of rejection, he's implacable. You can't give him anything that will appease his rejection. It, it, it can't be done. It's impossible. You can't appease the carnal man's sense of rejection. You can't do it. It's terrible for both sides. Because the man never ever feels accepted. Because he's always trying to draw it out of men. And he'll never get it. And the people are trying to appease it. But he'll never be appeased. <laughs> because he's locked in his expectation of rejection. And he's appeasing it with all his false comforts of pleasures of life. And he locked into that state. That is a bad state to be in. That's why we want to look at root and self. We want to deal with rejection, bitterness issue. Slightly healed. We don't want to be slightly healed. Well, the, like I said, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were wounded. They were rejected. They, were, they had a cry. But it wasn't a condition yet to have compassion on them. The compassion is when you come to yourself. You know your own sore. You know your own grief. That's when you, when you have compassion. You know your own sore. You know your own grief. The Bible says, Give strong drink to them who are wounded, ready to perish. When you know your own sore, your own grief, your own weakness, your own inadequacies, your own uh, frailties before God, and to the point where you almost lose confidence, is there any hope for me? That's a person ready to perish. That's when God. That's when God comes and has compassion. That's when God. That's when you mm. give him strong drink. Give him a strong anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, don't forget his misery and his poverty. He's he's in his affliction. Hear this now that you're drunken, not with wine. You're afflicted, not with wine. Well, there you go. You're fighting a losing battle with implacability. I found this in various. I've I've been like this at times. I rec eventually recognize. Wow, I'm so. I expect rejection so much that even if someone were to try to appease me and show acceptance, I don't know if I'd even believe it, <laughs> right? Well, then in a case like that, don't even try because I, I can't be appeased. I'm implacable then. I'm impla you're playing the losing game. Yeah. When you're full of that much expectation of rejection, you place the charge on, on outwardly. You, you, you charge others. Your expectation of rejection is so strong that even if acceptance is demonstrated from the other person, you don't have any capacity or room or faith within yourself to believe that in that acceptance. That's where rejection murders the other person. 
So that's what you... And this goes back to what I've said a lot, uh, a number of times about the idea of being a victim. I, I kind of uh, adjust my perception of this as I go along. I don't want to say no one's ever a victim, but I say ultimately the Christian, once a Christian comes to Jesus Christ, and you have the blood of Jesus, you have the power of God, you have mercy, grace, forgiveness, you have fellowship, you have all the means by which you can be made whole, then we have to strive towards a con uh, condition where we do not consider ourselves victims. And, and to support that scripturally, I pointed out that Jesus Christ was the propitiation for our sin. He, that means he was the atoning victim. He was the atoning victim. Now, I, I don't want to mock or make light of anyone who's been victimized or traumatized or um, assaulted or sexually abused or anything like that. Those things happen and those things happen to people without the people themselves having much power over it. But once you come to the Lord, we have to strive towards not casting ourselves in our own sight as victims, a victim mentality, because we have to overcome those things. Okay, so if you, if you play the victim mentality too, too much, cultivate it too much, then you're going to sit underneath your bondage. You're going to excuse your condition. God, God wants us to overcome it. Like I say, I'm not trying to mock real trauma or real victimization as it may occur to people. But, uh, yeah, who was the only person who suffered and really he did not deserve anything that he suffered for? Jesus. Jesus. The, the, one, the other thief said, you know, hey, do you not fear God seeing we're in the same condemnation? And why are you mocking? We're, we're, we're here. We're on this cross. We're suffering because, you know, we've sinned and we're, worth, we're, we're worthy of this. And that's because, uh, by and large, psychology and psychiatry cultivate the victim mentality in people to the point where they will not overcome. They don't want to overcome anymore. I'm not going to go into this, but I'm going to read a few quotes just to sort of end this off for now. If you remember many years ago, probably 15 years ago, I started preaching on this stuff. And um, I, I preached on it in reference to a woman who was a Canadian psychiatrist who left the profession because she felt like, uh, well, she didn't feel like, she, she observed that um, that the profession was cultivating uh, people into victim mentality and that uh, they would, in, in so doing, they would never rise above their problems. They would never overcome. They would more and more and more slip into a selfish state of selfishness and neediness and uh, blaming things on what happened to them. They were reinforcing, in other words, they were reinforcing their bitter experiences rather than being healed of them and giving them up and letting themselves be, be healed. Of course, the, the heathen can't be truly healed. That's what the Bible says when God chastens us. Make straight paths for your feet. You know, rise up and walk. You know, that which is lame, let it rather be healed. But if you cultivate victim mentality, then you excuse yourself, you become spiritually lame. You don't rise up, you don't overcome. So I'm not trying to mock victimization or trauma, but I'm just saying the Christian has to ultimately go for the mark where they do not consider themselves a victim. Then they will believe in the ability to overcome and be healed. So there's all these uh, quotes of these psychologists who wrote articles and books and things. They're very telling and they're an indictment on their own profession. A pernicious effect of psychology on individuals and society is that cultivating the notion that they are the victims of life. The theories of the psychology industry exist as totems which reduce people to weak, passive, vulnerable children, more intent on focusing and nurturing on their inner child and their wounds rather than strengthening their resolve as adults, you know, to get past it. So there's a study where men and women receive psychological treatment after claiming to have recovered from repressed memories, and that's a whole other issue. Repressed memories of sexual child abuse, they claim that they, have, they had forgotten, but they recovered, some, recovered these memories of sexual abuse from when they were children. And through this therapy of recovering the remembrance of things that happened to them, rather than like the Bible says, forget those things that are behind and reach forth. Okay, because they practiced recovering and rehearsing those memories out of all those people 
10% showed suicidal tendencies before this kind of treatment and 70% afterwards. And her, her own words, uh, this, this lady, I'll, I might preach on it some other time. Psychology manufactures victims who ultimately become dependent clients with no escape from their problems. Always dependent, always locked in. For a psychologist to know the mystery of human consciousness is a colossal and dangerous hubris. And that means it's a very proud and arrogant assumption to think that psychologists know the mystery of the human conscience. Psychology, psyche is the Greek word for soul or the heart of man. Ology is the study of, the study of the soul of man. Does man know the soul or the heart? No, he doesn't know it. Only God knows it and as he reveals it to the body of Christ. That's the only true healing we get. Another man, uh, I'm not going to make references. I took these as quotes out of books and articles and things. I'm just trying to streamline this because I'm going to try to close. But these are psychologists and psychiatrists who become disenchanted with their own profession, okay? We've had 100 years of psychotherapy and the world is getting worse. You know, I've said a number of times, we've had 2,000 years of grace and truth that came by Jesus Christ after 2,000 years of grace and truth. And we're living in the most iniquitous, stubborn, rebellious, wicked generation that ever was upon the face of the earth. No, it's not grace's fault, not truth's fault, not Jesus' fault. Of how much sorrow punishment, you know, go on and on about that. Now, this guy is named Paul Witz, and he wrote a book called Psychology as Religion. Contemporary psychology amounts to little more than the worship of self. Well, isn't that what you do? You sit on the couch or you go see the shrink? You lay on the couch, well, Doc, it all started when I was a little boy and Mommy wouldn't let me have the Oreos after dinner. And I was traumatized by that. And Then the next thing happened is they used to call me names at school. And You know, what's he doing? He's trying to spill his beans to the shrink, right? But what's he doing? He's just rehashing and reliving and reinforcing his, his stupid little trips of life and whatever. Make himself feel more and more like a victim, more and more wrapped up in himself, more and more selfish, more and more wrapped up, never resolving, never overcoming. <laughs> see, that's what psychology has done. It's the counterfeit. Yeah, so Christians shouldn't go see psychologists, shouldn't go see psychiatrists. Now, before I was a Christian, or as I was becoming one, I didn't know any better, and I went to see a psychiatrist. Now, in the grace of God, this psychiatrist was not one of the... Well, he wasn't too weird of a psychiatrist. He wasn't the kind of guy to prescribe drugs and things. And he just helped me sort of reason things out. And he was a kind of a sensible guy. And it actually sort of tided me over until I received the Holy Ghost and could get some healing and deliverance. And then and when, once I learned about psychologists and psychiatrists, I, I stopped going. But anyway... The culture, Christopher Lash wrote a book called The Culture of Narcissism. He said, the mission of post-Freudian therapies, in other words, where psychology has taken Freud's ideas, post-Freudian, where we are at now, he said that the mission of those post-Freudian therapies is the gratification of every impulse. Perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of their, helped right along by psychology and psychiatry, helped right along. Psychology's Sanction for Selfishness is another book. The popular psychology theories that emerged after Freud are rooted in the assumption that serving self is the sole functional ethical principle. Serve self. Please self. Talk to me about, talk to the shrink about yourself. Well, I'll tell you, it's a deep mystery. Of that, that mystery of iniquity is a deep thing and you're not, gonna, you're not going to appease it or overcome it like, that, like this. So what am I saying? Well, that's how people try to deal with their wounds and their rejection and their traumas and their galls of bitterness through psychiatry. Well, it's not going to work that way. You have to know you're accepted by God. That's our goal. Work it out. Pray. Seek His face. Seek God. Get some root in yourself, whatever the cost. Yeah, it may cost some affliction, and, but you're going to be afflicted anyway, right? For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. brethren. You are accepted in the beloved, in the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Whosoever therefore shall confess, confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Whoso shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? Who can bear? 
a spirit wounded in the expectation of reject, rejection, so convinced in rejection that nothing you can say or do will ever convince it that it's accepted. Nothing. Who can bear that? The one who's rejected in his bondage of, of uh, sinful rejection, gall of bitterness. It's a losing battle. Of course, you can take that into the spiritual realm too, right? Now, if you reject, if God is continually rejected, as if mankind continually rejects God, you think that doesn't produce a wound in God's heart? And, and rejection does produce a wound. And the thing about rejection is it's a kind of a slow, subtle work, you know. It, it can be a very subtle thing, rejection. It, it can look nice on the outward appearance, but in the undertow, it's actually still rejecting, re- rejecting you. Again, I, I, ho- I hope I can do this uh, in a righteous way. But I, I struggle with that in the exercise of my calling. People can be nice to me, do nice things for me, do me a service in, in this life, be very kind, gentle and forthcoming and everything else, right? But if they refuse to have anything to do with what God sent me for, right? If they won't come and they won't submit to teaching or won't be a partaker of the spiritual side of things, it's not like they're full of hatred or anything, but there's a subtle undercurrent there that eat, that'll eat away at you. That's like, well, why, why are they rejecting the spiritual aspect of things? Why are they? So it's not an overt thing, but it's a subtle thing. And rejection can work like that. Now, having said that, in Isaiah, God said to his people, um, Isaiah 43, This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. Thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Thou hast brought, not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast, brought me, thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins, and thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions for my own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance, let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Thy first father hath sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed against me. So it's this statement, Thou hast made me to serve with thy sins, and wearied me with thine iniquities. This is the heart of God saying, You're putting me in a position where I have to demonstrate my willingness, my desire to love you and accept you. You're making me demonstrate it, demonstrate it in all these carnal, sort of worldly contexts. You wearied me with your. You, you've made me to serve with your sins. You've wearied me with your iniquities. Well, the way I see this is, is that God, is if you know if we're always saying to God, "Oh God, I pray, help me get a new car." All right, God, help me get that job that I that good job. Or, oh God, give me the wisdom to fix this ice maker. Right, and God loves me if I'm His son. God loves me. He wants to demonstrate it somehow. He wants to give me a demonstration. Right to establish something, but it's kind of in a sinful, worldly context. I'm wearying him with my sins and iniquities. He wants to get this into the spiritual realm. He wants to bring it into the spiritual realm. Yeah. Well, so if you, whatever, if you fix my computer or if, if you do my laundry and you serve me in in this life and according to the flesh, that's that's fine. That's good. It's good to do service and everything else. But what about being partaker of the spiritual part of it here? And after a while, it becomes a grief, a wound. Obviously, God's heart can get wounded, right, by rejection. But when it gets ultimately rejected, you know, grief grief turns to anger, anger turns to hate and wrath. And on God's part, God's hatred is always righteous, His wrath is always righteous, His judgments are always righteous. Well, if you vex and grieve and cause and reject the heart, reject God, God, cause God's heart to experience rejection, Ultimately, if it goes to its final end, his, his spirit's wounded, how are you going to stand? Who can stand, right? A wounded spirit. Who can bear it? Who can bear it? Who's going to bear God on the great white throne, throne judgment knowing you've rejected him your whole life? Who's going to bear it? You can look at it that way too. It's like we say, the uh, acts of affection in the natural are like the acts of affection and intimacy in the spiritual. You can kiss and then you can actually have physical intercourse you can have in a relationship right well if i serve you carnally all the time you know i cut your grass for you i fix your lawnmower i do this i do that that's all good there's nothing wrong with that that is kissing that's the initial contact of flesh to flesh 
communicating affection and desire and so forth in the spiritual realm. But if we're going to become one, we've got to go into the spiritual realm. We've got to be partaker of each other's spiritual walks and callings and issues and all of that. It can't just be carnal service, carnal service, carnal service. You can kiss all day long and uh, in a relationship and never bring forth a child because all you do is kiss, 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 and it never goes beyond that. And this is what God's saying. You made me serve with your sins. You know, so you made me kiss you, kiss you in this worldly context. You're in the, you know, you're in the sinful world, if you will. You're in a sinful context. You've made me to serve with your sins. You've worried me with your iniquities. God wants to take this intimate. He wants to get the intimate. He wants to go spiritual with this stuff. He wants to go spiritual. And you have to because then you, that's the only way you get your root and self. Okay, so the honor that comes from God. Rejection is a terrible thing. It has to be dealt with by knowing you're accepted by God, God himself. It goes beyond all flesh. It goes beyond all everything. It's just you and God, you and God. That's why, by the way, as we heard, that's why repentance is the purest form of worship. Because when you repent against thee and against thee only. So what the issue of repentance, is it between me and Brother Enoch or Brother Christopher? Is, is that where my issue of repentance is? Is it, is it between me and the Apostle Paul? Oh, me and an angel from heaven? No, no. My heart sinned against God. It's, the issue is my heart to God. No stinking flesh is going to pollute this pure work of repentance because it's between your soul and God. That's pure repentance when it's between the soul and God. That's the only acceptable repentance. No man involved, no flesh involved. Man comes to himself between him and God. And that's why I'm saying there's a purity of relationship and acceptance and that purity of relationship and ex- acceptance is the root in yourself and it's between you and God and nothing else. That's where you got to get. That's the perfection. That's the strength. That's the deliverance. That's the liberty. That's the freedom. That's the intimacy. That's the communion with Jesus Christ. The fellowship with Jesus Christ and with all the saints. The woman of Samaria, she was an outcast. I always always say it like this. Jesus came to that well, the woman... And Jesus was having trouble with his disciples. You know, how is it that you have no faith? How come you can't believe? So Jesus was having issues with his disciples relating to them. And of course, Jesus couldn't relate to the, those who are without. And, but somehow, he managed to strike up a relationship and a rapport with this woman from Samaria. Well, what were the Samaritans? They were outcasts. They were rejects. Jesus is going to strike a rapport with you, an intimacy with you. On the platform of rejection. You're going to relate to Jesus Christ and become intimate and uh, adore Him and love Him. And He's going to love you and console you and be intimate with you and make you whole and commune with you on the platform of rejection. When you're rejected of men, you're chosen of God. Right? So rejection is rejection. But it can't be rejection of the old man trying to become uh it can't be the old man's rejection trying to be be appeased by by compelling acceptance out of everybody else that's a dead end that'll never work you'll just die in your rejection it's implacable cannot be appeased don't even try if you're in that situation don't even try to appease someone like that it's a dead end all right so go for the root and self that's it i'm done praise the lord god bless y'all